Only liberal Britain will tolerate his presence on her soil. He heads to London to live in exile. The year is 1849. But today, that man's writings are still dangerous. They're so radical, so revolutionary, they continue to divide the world. It's been more than 150 years since he started writing about the world. But you know what? If you're looking for an explanation of the global economic crisis, he's a surprisingly good place to start. With everything going so wrong, you have to wonder, is Karl Marx turning out to be right? Most people know Marx as the father of communism. You might be surprised to hear that most of what he wrote was about capitalism. And today, his ideas about that are being taken seriously right at the heart of global business. His analysis was pretty on the button and, and explains a lot, I think, about some of the things that we see going on around in our economy today. For Marx, the best argument against capitalism was that it was inherently unfair. His ideas on inequality have more resonance than ever today. What Marx did do is to install this sense of urgency. Things cannot go on forever the way they are. In this series, I'll tell you about the lives and revolutionary thinking of three extraordinary men. John Maynard Keynes, Friedrich Hayek, and Karl Marx. Their worlds were changing as never before. They saw that the fate of nations would hang on the power of money, and they had radically different ideas about how to control it. Today, the stakes could hardly be higher. All three of these men were giants whose ideas live on. But they speak to us right now because they, more than anyone, recognise the double-edged power of money, how markets could transform all of our lives, but also plunge us into chaos. Keynes and Hayek argued about whether government should try to tame this force of human nature, capitalism. Karl Marx had the most radical advice of all. Get rid of it. In 1989, Karl Marx's reputation lay in ruins. What a mess. For most of us, the fall of the Berlin Wall meant the end of Marx. Millions rejected the horrors of a violent and repressive police state. And because the communist countries claimed Marx as their inspiration, his ideas were cast aside as well. When this wall came down, I was just studying economics at university. Back then, we knew, or we thought we knew, two things about Marxism communism. One was it hadn't delivered freedom for the workers, quite the opposite. The other, just as bad if you're an economist, is it hadn't delivered prosperity. The communist approach to the economy just hadn't worked. While the free market West took great strides, the communist planned economies had been left behind. Marx's reputation as an economist was in shreds. In the last few years, something strange has happened. It's like the global financial crisis has brought Karl Marx back from the dead. And we still don't care what he said about communism, but people are going back to his damning assessment of capitalism, all its deep-seated flaws, with a nagging doubt. Is it all now coming true? When times were good, 
Marx was nowhere. But now the Western economies are in crisis, he's attracting new interest right at the heart of the economic establishment. From a former IMF chief economist... Marx is right on a number of dimensions. Uh, um, he certainly is right uh, that income inequality can be a source of, of tremendous tension. To the man who saw the 2008 crisis coming... He understood that uh, there are situations in which uh, capitalism and globalisation can lead uh, to economic crisis. And an economist at one of the world's leading banks. It's quite hard to convince people who live in Chelsea or Chelmsford that this is of uh, great relevance to them, but actually um, it's worth a bash. Anyone in Chelsea or Chelmsford who thinks Marx is only about communism is in for a shock. It's what he said about capitalism that rings so true today. Marx's key insight was that capitalism was inherently unstable. He said we'd lurch from crises to crisis and society would become increasingly unequal. Marx divided the world into bosses and workers. For him, they would always be at odds, and that battle was a recipe for crises. To make profit, bosses squeeze what they pay workers. The crisis comes when workers then don't have enough money to buy what bosses are trying to sell them. And for decades after World War II, that looked completely wrong. We had years of stable growth, and the workers were taking a larger and larger share of the pie, but not anymore. Marx would explain this crisis in terms of the fact that ordinary people haven't got enough money to spend. Why haven't they got enough money to spend? Because there's been a big redistribution over the last few decades away from ordinary people towards capital, towards wealth. And for Marx, there's no turning back. He thought there were laws of motion running through human history. Capitalism would produce bigger and bigger crises, and then it would collapse. And he believed that the force driving us to this final collapse was the same one that built our world in the first place, the power of money. Marx had a very simple formulation about crises, which is that they are manifestations of the fundamental flaws or contradictions, as he called them, of capitalism. How would Marx have suggested solving the crisis is, of course, by abolishing capitalism. Is capitalism living on borrowed time? Are you asking, are you taking me? Are you asking me? Sometimes it doesn't feel that far-fetched. Here's why I've been thinking more about Marx. It's because the last few years hasn't felt like an ordinary recession. It hasn't felt like a crisis for one economy or for a group of economies in the West. At times, it really has felt like a crisis for the system, for capitalism as we know it. You want a bigger explanation, and no one's ever had a bigger explanation for everything that's happened than Karl Marx. Capitalism's most implacable critic was born in the picture postcard town of Trier in what is now southwest Germany. Today, his birthplace makes its own contribution to the local economy. It's a big draw for tourists. But do you still have a lot of people? coming here, tourists yes, from around the world? We have more than 40,000 tourists here, and 25% uh, uh, came from China. So a quarter of them come from, come from China yes, to yeah. see Marx's yeah. birthplace. And what do they buy? What do they like? Do they like the uh, red chocolate. The Karl Marx chocolate. Yes. Maybe I should get some of that as well, actually. And the wine. Uh, Marx's father, Heinrich Marx, oh. he had a vineyard nearby Trier. 
And you don't think that Karl Marx would mind you selling all this stuff? A bit capitalist having this shop. Perhaps he uh, is, uh, did enjoy it because um, he had a good humor too. <laughs> The man with the big theory about our world had big dreams right from the start. When he was 17, Marx had to write an essay about picking the right career. He said the best position in life was to serve all of mankind so your deed would live on perpetually at work and over your ashes would be shed the hot tears of noble people. I wonder, would that young man, that rather grand young man, be surprised to hear that his first home had been turned into a museum? Probably not. But for all his ambitions, Marx was hardly a model student. When he was at university in Berlin, he earned a reputation as a radical thinker. Marx comes across as a, a young man, as this sort of energetic, fiery, hairy figure. He, he was known as the wild boar or the moor, which sort of points to his sort of Levantine complex. He was full of ideas, he was full of debate, he liked big drinking sessions and then deep philosophical debate about uh, the nature of Christ and uh, German romanticism and, and politics. By the time he was 24, Dr Marx was a bit of a Renaissance man. He was an expert in law, philosophy, you name it. In fact, the only thing he didn't know much about was economics. That all changed in 1842. Marx, by now working as a journalist, heard about a controversy in this wood that would help shape his understanding of how the world works. Peasants taking sticks from the forest floor to use as firewood were being prosecuted for theft. Wood had been gathered here for centuries, but now the landowners had declared it belonged to them. What had been freely shared was now private property. You could say that thinking about this question turned Marx into an economist, but that wouldn't really capture it. He came to think that economics, the nature of economic relationships between people, were at the heart of absolutely everything. The foundations of Marx's thinking was, was materialism, that when you cut away religion, ideology, politics, at its root were the material relations between man, the need for food, the need to have a roof over your head. This is what ultimately drives so much of human interaction. What was unique in Marx, he didn't see economy just as a special sphere. He saw economy as the structuring principle of the entire social totality. For Marx, it all begins with private property, which divides the world starkly. There are those that have it and those that don't. Take this wood. Before it became private property, I could do what I like with it. I could heat my house with it. I could make a chair and exchange it for food. But if it belongs to someone else, the whole relationship changes. Now Marx would say, I become a member of the proletariat. Now I have to work for the owner of the wood, the capitalist, for a wage. Then he can sell what I've made for more than he paid me. Look what's happened. Something that was part of my life is now a financial transaction. The capitalist's made profit. He can use that to buy more wood, build factories, make more profit, and so it goes on. Profit is now the heart of everything. So there you have it, the Marxian view of capitalism, or the gist of it anyway. If you want more, you'll have to wade through hundreds of pages of Marx for yourself. The key point for us is that that driving force of capitalism, the need to earn more and more profit, well, Marx thought that was also a recipe for constant crises. So Marx would say you could trace the roots of the crisis we're in today right to the very heart of capitalism, to its need to generate profit. <laughs> <laughs>
France was seeing in Trier was a world in flux. Feudalism was on the way out. An entirely new way of doing things had arrived. Now we know what capitalism's really made of. And the power of money today means a lot more than just throwing a few peasants in jail. A bunch of guys in a trading floor can turn the entire economy upside down. Around the world, all of our lives depend on markets, on capitalism being able to deliver. If Marx is right, if it's fundamentally flawed, still exploiting them, always striving to make more profit. In Marx's world, any capitalist that doesn't seek maximum profit is soon replaced by one who does. So the system follows a completely predictable course, he would say, to its own destruction. It's not an idea that many people accept. He was completely wrong, including the idea that capitalism was merely a phase and contained within it the seeds of its own destruction. That's not the case. Well, everything is bound to collapse if you wait long enough. I mean, the Earth's going to, you know, be sucked into the sun someday. You know? You'd be forgiven for thinking the total collapse of capitalism sounds a little implausible. How could seeking profit be so disastrous when it's done such amazing things? Just look at how we eat under capitalism. We get fresh fruit flown in from all over the world. We can choose from 700 types of breakfast cereal. We have enough of it and it's all safe to eat. This incredible plenty and the technology it depends on didn't come from the state. It's what happens when you let capitalists compete for profit. They didn't do it for our benefit. They did it because it made them rich. So at first glance, Marx's idea that capitalism's search for profit would be its downfall sounds absurd. Profit may often sound venal, it may often sound wrong, but it is what pushes progress ahead. Profit is actually what drives the world forward, and that's what Marx could never quite handle. The profit motive is essential. Uh, I mean, after all, what is the profit motive? It's just a way of, of achieving a better society by people wanting to better their own individual lot. When you think of how fundamentally the profit motive has shaped and enriched our world, it's no wonder Marx fell out of favour. But you shouldn't dismiss Dr Marx quite yet. I mean, it's true, he talked a lot about class exploitation, misery, chaos, but he didn't think capitalism was all bad. Far from it. What you probably don't know, what I find most interesting, is what's in the middle. One of the most perceptive and admiring bits of writing about capitalism I've ever read. In fact, it reads a lot truer now than when it was written. 
think what's surprising about a lot of Marx's writing is that you find in amongst the communism a lot of good analysis of capitalism and actually you also find within it um, quite a lot of praise for capitalism. Marx's attitude towards capitalism is basically ambiguous. He's at the same time, he was honest here, Marx, ultra fascinated. He was fully aware that this is the most productive dynamic system in the history of humanity and so on. The truth is, Marx did understand that the drive for profit would achieve incredible things. It has been the first to show what man's activity can bring about. It's accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts and Gothic cathedrals. It has conducted expeditions that put in the shade all former exoduses of nations and crusades. He did really get the kind of global aspect. He got the idea that people were suddenly being able to get things from all the way around the world in a completely new way and the impact of that. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. It creates a world after its own image. But you know there's got to be a downside for the bourgeoisie. Modern bourgeois society is like the sorcerer who's no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. What the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all is its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. It's stirring stuff, but it does raise a bit of a puzzle. How can Marx think the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, are so brilliant and yet so doomed? Well, for him, it all came down to the way they treat their staff. To understand Marx's analysis of crises, we have to first understand the capitalism that he knew. 19th century capitalists might have built wonders surpassing Egyptian pyramids, but they also forced their workers to endure terrible conditions and pay. The Industrial Revolution and all the incredible achievements that followed were made possible by coal miners. This is a replica of what it was like at Victoria near the underground. The man you can see at far side, he had a pick and shovel and he'd work the coal, fill that cough, and then his wife had to drag that coal behind her to a loading point, which well, could be up to 30, 40 metres away. I didn't realise that they were, their husband and wives had worked there. Oh, yeah, it were all families. Yeah. They needed they need a little boy or a little girl to work this door as well. So but if you took the job, you had to sort of provide small child. Yeah. So. The only light they had between them was a candle which the dad kept so he could see mm. what he was in at coffee. So the little boy or girl was sat on their own in the dark for 12 hours a day. It is difficult to overstate the horror of industrialisation in Europe. In 1829, Liverpool, for example, a life expectancy at birth was about 28 years. And that was the lowest age since the Black Death. So the impact of the Industrial Revolution on life chances was absolutely terrifying. By 1849, his revolutionary writings had got Marx banned from everywhere but Britain. Here he could observe the power money had to ruin lives, at a suitably safe distance, of course. I think in the last few minutes I've come closer to what it was actually like, the drudgery of Victorian times, than Karl Marx ever did. He never went to a mine, and as far as we can tell, he only went to a factory once towards the end of his life. But it didn't stop him writing vividly about the horrors of Britain's dark satanic mills. The horrors of Victorian working conditions clearly shaped Marx's economics. In his time, minimum pay for proles meant maximum profits for bosses, 
and any bosses who did choose to pay more usually went bust. He thought there'd always be downward pressure on wages and that wages would come down to the minimum that enabled bare survival. They couldn't go lower than that, otherwise the workers would die. But he thought they'd be depressed down to that minimum. The reality, of course, has been the opposite. It has been a continual advancement in wages, year in, year out, decade in, decade out. Marx was wrong. He thought it would all get so bad, the workers would overthrow the system. Yet even as he was writing, reformers were beginning to get rid of the worst employment practices. Capitalism got kinder, not nastier. But the idea that the competing interests of bosses and workers would cause crises, well, that does seem relevant today. That's a very sophisticated argument, so I'm going to need children's toys to explain it. But let me say right at the start, none of these toys endorse any kind of violent revolution. Now, here's the mine owner, capitalist, miners, <laughs> with or without hat. Now, imagine that there aren't very many miners around. Then, the mine owner has to compete with the other capitalists for workers probably ends up having to pay them more than you'd like to. The trouble is those high costs cut into profits. Now, if that's happening across the economy, you've got a declining rate of profit and a lot of capitalists going out of business. You get a crisis. You get countless workers losing their jobs, having a terrible time, until finally wages fall far enough the capitalists can go back to exploiting them again. So, high labour costs are bad for business. But what makes the collapse of capitalism inevitable for Marx is that the bosses are in trouble even when they have things their own way. Now imagine the opposite situation. You've got loads of workers, all of this lot, competing for a single job. Then, well, no wonder he's smiling. The capitalist only has to pay the workers the bare minimum. This bucket is what Marx would have called the industrial reserve army of the unemployers. As long as that's full, this lot can keep paying very low wages and keep making profits. Except, in the end, there's a problem badly paid workers don't spend very much and not very much spending in an economy is not good for business. You get another crisis, more capitalists going bust and this crisis is going to be harder to fix. So you can see why Marx thought the capitalists were in trouble no matter what they do. They never want to pay the workers more money. They always need to make more profit but in seeking out profit they end up eroding the basis on which it's made. They've forgotten, if you like, where their money ultimately comes from. The punchline, as ever with Marx, is that capitalism is doomed. So that's how problems with wages can cause crises, at least in theory. But how is any of that relevant to right now? A Marxist would say that little parable with the toy men tells you everything you need to know about the financial crisis we've just seen. In fact, they'd say you could explain the last 40 years of world history entirely in terms of capitalism's desperate need to have the advantages of a ready supply of cheap labour, but none of the costs. And you don't have to take my word for it. Let's take a look at the last 40 years of history through the prism of Marx's theories to show how they might explain the mess we're in. An imaginary Marxist broadcasting corporation would see it all as a good old 1970s-style class struggle. As usual, the world's divided between workers and capitalists, always fighting to get a bigger slice of the pie. And the crisis happened, Marxists would argue, because the capitalists have been coming out on top a bit too often. The fight is over wages. Capitalists want to pay less, the workers want to get more. 
the 70s, powerful trade unions battled to keep wages high. Then we come to the 80s, fight back time for capitalists. This year, look, can you see an hour of it? Marx would have seen Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan as acting purely in the interests of the capitalist bosses. It was their governments that helped business by getting rid of the obstacles that made it hard to cut wages. The violence and intimidation we have seen should never have happened. It is the work of extremists. It is the enemy within. If they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. End of state. So for the Marxist Broadcasting Corporation, the capitalists won in the 1980s and they kept on winning. The guaranteed high wages and job security that workers had enjoyed until the 70s had gone. And downward pressure on wages started to lay the seeds of the crisis we see today. Well, it's great telly. Is it actually true? Well, we know the Marxist view of history is right about one thing, at least in Britain and America. Earnings at the very top have soared in the last few years and everyone else has been squeezed. In Britain, real earnings have been flat or falling for the best part of 10 years, since before the crisis. And in America, that's been happening since the 70s. In the United States, a full-time male worker, median, income has stagnated for a third of a century. Uh, no increase. Household income today is the same as it was 15 years ago. All the increase to the income has gone to the top. The share of income in the United States that was going to the top 1% of the households 20 years ago was around uh, 12%. Uh, today, that share is closer to 23%. Things haven't gone that far in the UK, but inequality is certainly creeping up the agenda. So have the greedy capitalists been picking the pockets of the workers? So why do I think all that money has been flowing to the top well, I don't think it's a big conspiracy, but there have been social and political changes that have made a difference. We used to have really big unions. We used to have very high tax rates on rich people. And we had social norms. It just wasn't done for the people running a bank to take a huge chunk of the profits for themselves. Those things help keep a lid on inequality. We don't have them anymore. But really crucial to all of this has been the changing structure of our economy. A lot of it's down to new tech. Fewer workers needed, there are more competing for every job, meaning bosses can pay them less. But perhaps the most significant factor is globalisation. With falling barriers to trade around the world, global business has gained access to a giant new pool of cheaper labour. You have brought into the market now millions and millions of new workers in China, in India, in other parts of Asia, in parts of South America, Brazil, for instance. So that process has transformed. Emerging market economies, 
there'll be an overwhelming vote in favour of what has happened because almost everyone is better off than they were and would have been. But that's less evident in the industrialised world where many lower paid people have become even lower paid relative to those who've prospered. And that is a concern. For years after World War II, we could be pretty sure Marx was wrong. Where you had capitalism, it was working pretty well. You could talk about a rising tide lifting all boats. But you look at the global economy today, I think you see a capitalism that Marx would recognise. It's lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty in China, but for most ordinary people in the West, the system's not working at all. For them, capitalism's not coming through on its side of the deal. It's an analysis that rings true even for the leader of the world's biggest economy. Long before the recession, jobs and manufacturing began leaving our shores. Technology made businesses more efficient, but also made some jobs obsolete. Folks at the top saw their incomes rise like never before. But most hardworking Americans struggled with costs that were growing, paychecks that weren't, and personal debt that kept piling up. Marx would say this squeeze on wages was the root cause of the huge economic crisis that we've been living through. But you might see a problem with the Marxist explanation. If it was all down to low wages, you'd expect the crisis to have started where people spend their pay, out in the real economy. One way or another, that is how most of the recession since the war have got started. But this time, it wasn't the high street that sank the city, it was the other way around. The explosion that rocked the global economy in 2008 was detonated deep inside the banks. So how would Marx link low wages to troubled banks? The answer is, he saw capital as endlessly adaptable. It could solve one problem, low wages, but only at the cost of creating another. Remember, Marx didn't underestimate capitalism. He thought it was fundamentally flawed. He didn't think it was stupid. If large parts of the population weren't being paid enough to support demand, well, he wouldn't have been at all surprised to hear the capitalists had come up with a brilliant solution. to all of capitalism's woes, but only for a while. Remember, Marx thought the system was fundamentally flawed. They might be very clever, these capitalists, but now more than ever, they were living on borrowed time. Baby, your ship is As we know, it went well beyond credit cards. What ultimately brought the crisis to a head was the billions borrowed on mortgages. People thought the value of their house would keep going up forever. Housing credit is beautiful because if your house price is increasing and you're borrowing against the increase in value of your house, you don't feel you're borrowing your way into debt. But of course you are. In America, it happened on a massive scale. There, as we know, the capitalists were getting richer and richer. They couldn't spend all of their extra money. Driven, as ever, by the desire to make more profit, they lent it out in riskier and riskier ways. The name given to this lending might well be familiar. Subprime. What we did is, as the incomes of most Americans were stagnating or, or even declining, we said, don't let it bother you. Keep spending as if your income was going up. 
And, and they did that very well. I mean, who would oppose it? The banks who are making money? Uh, the households who are getting their, their house? The politicians who have happy constituents? I mean, there is no, nobody who's going to be unhappy in this process until it collapses. And we all know how it ended. In retrospect, it seems obvious. Lending to people who couldn't afford it wasn't a lasting solution to anything. It led to a housing bubble which burst, threatening some of the world's biggest banks. And thanks to our integrated world, what started in the United States spread and infected the entire system, causing a global recession. So here's the Marxist explanation for the crisis we've just seen. You've got a global economy with businesses getting better and better at squeezing wages and pushing up profits. But there's a problem. They're producing a lot of stuff that the workers can no longer afford and a lot of profits looking for a new home. The global property bubble provided an answer to both those problems. The system was kept afloat on a mountain of debt, but it was only a matter of time before it all came crashing down. Capitalism's only ever as strong as its latest about Marx since this crisis started. How did you come to look at him again? Actually, it was on this trading floor. Uh, it was probably the weekend before Lehman's went bust, and uh, it's normally a little bit noisy, but at the time, it was you could hear a pin drop. It was that deathly quiet, and I, I could almost feel, you know, that the global system was frozen. Um, and it was quite a scary thought. It took me back to a lot of the things that I used to read about and study when I was much younger, the days when I actually read Marx uh, for fun. And you wrote about that, and what was the reaction? I did get a lot of hate mail, I have to say. There are a lot of people who were quite opposed to the idea that anything that was socialistic or Marxist, you know, could be at all considered serious in the mainstream. Uh, a lot of this hate mail, I have to say, came from the United States, and I was accused of being, you know, an Obama clone and... President Obama, the well-known Marxist. The well-known <laughs> Marxist. Very mysterious forces. Uh, so there was a lot of negative reaction from, I think, people that probably predictably, um, you know, had already tied their own ideological colours to the mast. But the people who do find value in Marx aren't necessarily going to follow him all the way. I think Marx helps in framing the problem, but I think the solutions have to be different given the different environment we are in. Except Marx would insist the trap is inescapable. Capitalists must seek profit above all else or they'll go out of business. So why would they ever choose to give workers a bigger share of the pie? What Marx would say is that we have to look for ways out of this crisis which look beyond the restoration of capitalist class power. And I think this is a time when we actually need to start to thinking about the revolutionary solution again. But who exactly is revolting against who? Marx divided the world neatly into workers and capitalists, but today his stark distinction is incredibly blurred. Bosses work for themselves and workers...
of us do have a stake in the system, whether mobile phones or pension plans, to stave off talk of armed revolt. But what about the people capitalism's failing? What does Marx have to say to them? It's really amazing how well Marx seems to understand our world, where we're more interconnected than he could ever have imagined, and where all the faces of capitalism, good and bad, are now on display in pretty much every corner of the globe. But he was the one who famously said it wasn't enough to interpret the world, the point was to change it. If you ask him what exactly we're supposed to replace capitalism with, well, he had remarkably little to say about that. As Marx entered his final years, he seemed quite content with the way things were. He'd been poor for a lot of his life, but by 1856, he had enough money to move to London's suburbs. The young firebrand now looked like part of the establishment. He would spend his day walking around Hampstead Heath. He would worry about personal finances. He would worry about his, his daughters and the expense of their piano lessons. I mean, he, he lived a, a remarkably bourgeois life in, in, in many ways. In his later years, Marx was the world authority on the revolution, but he didn't seem to be in a hurry to make it happen. Young, hot-headed socialists from around the world would come to North London to pay their respects, win his support. Mr M seemed happy to watch and wait. Marx only really had contempt for terrorists, those who were seeking to fast forward political progress by having change through, through arbitrary violence. You needed the economic fundamentals in place for a proper revolution uh, to succeed. To understand why he didn't want a rush revolution, we need to understand, for the last time, I promise, a bit more Marxist theory. As usual, he had a grand analysis of the history of the world. He saw the great sweep of humanity's endeavours, from the caveman to the slave societies of Greece and Rome to the feudalism of kings and castles, all of which was replaced in turn by our own capitalist system of bosses and workers. Incredibly unfair, but also incredibly productive. Marx said only when we'd got everything we could out of capitalism could we afford to have a revolution. In his words, the knell of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated, all to be replaced by more or less nothing. Irritatingly, there's next to no alternative laid out. Marx, basically, was not the one who simply give, gave us a blueprint, you know, five stages after capitalism, communism, here you have the basic guidelines, what to do, and so on. No, no, it's up to us. He just opened up the field. Is there an alternative to capitalism? I've no idea. Well, I suppose there could be all kinds of alternatives, dead silence, starvation, um, or, or, or the end of the world or anything. I simply have no idea if there is an alternative. It doesn't, it doesn't occur to me, it doesn't seem to me to be important. It's like saying, is there an alternative to weather? Marx said we couldn't describe what the next stage of human development would look like any more than a feudal serf could have described our lives today. To which you might say, fair enough. Except you might also think it was pretty telling. After all, nobody else has been able to describe a convincing alternative to capitalism either. I think he would have written a lot more had he lived 10 years more on what a socialist republic would look like. And who knows, but that might have saved the world a lot of bother. Fire! 
without his blueprint, we all know what happened next. There weren't any revolutions in the rich, developed countries, as Marx predicted. Instead, it happened in one of the world's poorest nations. Soviet Russia may have left Marx far behind, but it was an attempt to try something else, and many have drawn lessons from its failure. The truth is, at the moment, there are different forms of capitalism. But on the big argument about whether you really want to have a communist system or a capitalist one, that is pretty much one everywhere, I think. There are more humane versions of capitalism or more barbar barbaric forms of capitalism. Um, but I don't think there's a systemic alternative to capitalism. Will there ever be? Yes, I would think so. I mean, you know, nothing is forever, absolutely nothing. And uh, cap capitalism is not forever. But anyone looking for a fairer alternative knows they can't ever repeat what happened east of the Berlin Wall. Dictatorship, political oppression, and millions of ruined lives. From 1945 till 1989, this was the main remand centre for political prisoners in communist East Germany. Today, it's been turned into a memorial. There was a special ideology. Whoever we arrest, he or she is guilty. It's possible that places like this explain why even capitalism's toughest critics today seldom talk seriously about replacing it. You can see with all these protests in Europe, Greece and so on, I was in Spain, in Greece, asking always the same question. OK, what do you want? Apart from some purely moralistic answers, I didn't get any good concrete proposals, you know, answers like, oh, uh, money should serve people, not people serving money. My God, Hitler and everyone would have agreed with this, I'm sure. He would have thought that with this implosion of the banking system at the heart of the capitalism in the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and so on, there would be a huge uh, rush to uh, Marxism and extreme socialism. That hasn't really happened. Uh, it is uh, quite surprising, and I'm very pleased. But if memories of this place do fade, could there ever be an alternative to capitalism? Or should what happened here be a lesson for all time? If someone wants to seek an alternative to capitalism, and they're saying, by seeking that alternative, that capitalism is a system, rather than a fact of life. And they're saying that, for instance, that human nature can be altered. Fundamentally, they're revealing themselves as a utopian. And the problem with utopia is that it can only ever be approached across a sea of blood, and you never arrive. This is my big mantra when we left this recuse of utopians. Maybe, but the only real utopia is to think that with some cosmetic changes, things can go on indefinitely the way they are now. Marx died in 1883. In a speech at his grave, his longtime friend and collaborator Friedrich Engels declared his name and work will endure through the ages. For most of the 20th century, his name did endure, though usually for all the wrong reasons. But now it's the 21st century. What can this long-dead Prussian really say to us? Fundamentally, I think Marx reminds us that if capitalism doesn't work for everyone, it might not work at all. When you look at what's happening, the pressure on wages, can you understand why people are sort of looking again at, at some of Marx's analysis? 
Yes, it, the big picture. Um, the workers versus the capitalists. And there's no doubt that there have been significant changes in inequality and in the distribution of income, which make you pause about the benefits of the development of output and prosperity that we've seen. And I don't think you can afford to believe that the benefits of a market economy in bringing prosperity will be there unless there is a collective commitment to keep the system going. And that does require people to believe that everyone will benefit in the end.